Um, talking about fun nights, talking about DJing, there's a really funny article that popped up on my um, social media, on my Twitter feed, actually, that kind of uh, had me saying, I knew it on my desk when I was reading it, right? And this is concerning the one, the only Peggy Goo, who had a very interesting couple of years, isn't it, right? She came essentially out of nowhere for the most part, released a really banging track and kind of went woof. Right, the last couple of years, it's kind of really gone from strength to strength for her. She's really been successful. She's kind of popped off. She's done a fashion. She's got a record label. She's done a few remixes, played in a million places. And in general, she's been okay, right? Everything's been great in terms of a profession, her career. But I guess in terms of sentiment in the scene, in terms of her perception, how she's perceived, what people think of her, the gossip on the forums, in the comments and all that sort. It's been a bit indifferent. It's been a bit weird. It's been a bit topsy turvy. One minute she's everyone's friend. Next, next minute she's the pariah that is essentially ruining this beautiful thing that we call electronic music. Me, I'm, I'm not too sure. I fall somewhere in the middle. I think she's well and, you know, I've always been of the thinking anywhere. I've, I've said this to my friend plenty of times that I don't necessarily think she's a DJ. I, I look at her more so as an influencer first, then somebody happens to DJ and happens to do fashion. I think for the most part, she strikes me as somebody who was very much infatuated with the scene, dance music scene. I think if you've been to festivals, if you've been to club nights and you've seen the kind of cool guys and girls that hang around behind DJ booths and have hugs and stuff and, you know, do the whole air kisses and just hang around and they always happen to have VIP spots and they always happen to be posting about with this producer, that DJ. It seems like a fun place to be, right? And if you get involved in it and you and you hang around long enough, I'm sure you will end up picking up the love for the music, end up picking up having some courage to get behind the decks and then over time, because you've got the access to these amazing people, um, you might have the opportunity to play in some great clubs, right? Especially if you've got the talent to make music. Because the one thing people overlook about Peggy Goo is that she's a classically trained pianist or whatever it may be called, right? Because she's basically, she's Asian and she comes from money. So they, you know, they kind of, that's a thing that you kind of expect from somebody that comes from that kind of affluent well-to-do educated background that their parents you know put them into some kind of piano uh violin class or whatever it may be called right which is at the time probably something a bit cringy a bit annoying and something that you probably wouldn't have had that much enjoyment for especially when you're heading into your teenage years and your mom's forcing you to you know play fucking pharaoh jacker but as you grow up and you get into flipping electronic music suddenly all these skills that you've learned from actually knowing music theory you, you're gonna Making electronic music is going to be an absolute cinch. I'm sure she could probably close her eyes and make 10 EPs in a night if she wanted to, right? It's not hard. So I think a, a combination of her looks, you know, she's an attractive woman, a combination of her fashion sense and how she puts herself together, a combination of her love for the music and her just being a great person. It seems that to hang around and people seem to actually like her as a person and a combination of just, you know, the fact that she's got the skills, the actual talent to do something, I'm not surprised she's able to get where she's got to. But I think some people look at it like a, you know, like a, a story of privilege. I look at it as a story of circumstance, a story of kind of, it's, I think in general to be successful in life, has to be. it's like a confluence of things, right? It's like loads of things happening at the same time and then they sort of meet at the same time, at the same moment and suddenly, boom, you blow up. But I don't necessarily think it's one thing. I don't, I don't think you can just get somewhere in life just for, by who you know or by whatever it may be. I don't think that is it. It's not singular. It's always loads of things happening at the same time. And then it's up to you to, to kind of seize the opportunity and go for the next thing. But again, loads of negative segment behind it. So she kind of touched upon that on this interview here with ID Magazine, which I thought was very illuminating because again, I think it backs up my claim that I don't necessarily think she's a D. I don't necessarily look at her as a DJ in terms of like the purest sense of the word. And again, I don't mean a DJ purist as in like, I want her to be broken and you're playing underground parties for 200 people. I mean, just in terms of like, she doesn't necessarily, her actions don't necessarily look like somebody, she, she doesn't, she doesn't go about things in the same way like a Dixon would, right? Or like a Harvey would, or like a Ricardo Villalobos. She doesn't necessarily do that, or like a Seth Stroxer. She's not that, you know what I mean? It's a different sort of vibe. And again, I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's a good thing, right? You look at how successful someone like an Amelia Lenz has been and she's kind of essentially, I would say she's transitioned a bit from like being an influencer to being more so a DJ DJ. I think she probably had loads of opportunities to really dabble into her kind of fashion pedigree, which, you know, she was a runway model, a legit runway model. So she could easily have kind of leaned into it. But she seems to really have taken her time to really dedicate herself to only playing in clubs and festivals. She's kind of fucked off everything else for the most part. I only see her wearing merch, like t-shirts that she designs. I don't necessarily see her wearing 
fashion-y items for the most part behind the decks. I think someone like Nastia probably wears more fashion things than her. So you can see what you can see people's actions and what they're and then you can necessarily by by a DJ's actions, you should be able to make an assumption about what they want to do in the future or where they want to be position-wise. And for me, it looks like for the most part, Peggy Goo came into the scene more so for a cash grab, right? More so to kind of you know get her kind of boost her clout or notoriety and then kind of you know go from there again maybe she developed a love of djing over time but i think mostly it was more so an influencer thing and then it kind of went where it went in it and this interview kind of says uh basically agrees with what i my assertion from the first point so pegu discusses her online criticism and her, her resolution for 2020 this is an article from id again if you listen via the audio podcast i'll link it in the show notes we know um says the following Peggy Goo had a busy 2019 on top of playing uh, close to 100 gigs the world over. The South Korean DJ, producer, and now fashion designer known as known for her popular Instagram accounts as sophisticated deep house sets. She never fails to deliver. Recently launched her own record label and streetwear line, right? So a lot for a DJ. So on top of having 100 sets in one year, which is a nutty amount. Because you have to imagine, right? I think I did like, I think I must have played like, let's say I played like 52 sets in a year, right? That's fifty. That's one one a week. But that's mostly in London. That's mostly, if, essentially, all of them were in London. But imagine playing fifty two sets in a year, and you're traveling between different time zones, different continents. You know, late at night. Sometimes you might play until four at one place, then take the red eye, the first flight out in the morning to go play a festival in the afternoon. So it's a it's a really insane schedule. But it also puts into perspective how somebody like a Dixon. Remember when he got voted, you know, RA DJ four times in a year. I think he mentioned something like he wants to take his DJing sets down to 100. So they were above 100 before, which is just nutty to think of. You're playing more than 100 sets in one year. It's just really, really crazy. Especially because most of the DJs that do that sort of stuff, for the most part, they also produce or they also make remixes and edits. So the thing that actually got you all the sets, the thing that allowed you to kind of travel the world, you're now not able to do because you're playing so often. But then again, if you're a DJ, you don't want to say no to sets. You don't want to say no to gigs because you don't know if that's ever going to come back around again, right? Um, especially on a come up. I know for me, you know, playing in bars and pubs and stuff, it's so hard just to get regular sets to play around, especially in a, in a, you know, in like a fairly cosmopolitan city like London, where you know every other person you know is a DJ or photographer. It's very difficult to get gigs or to get slots to play anywhere. So the fact that you get something, you don't want to let that go, right? But sometimes being able to concentrate on the artistry side of things or the craft or falling in love back with the music is really important that's why you saw someone like a dixon say you know what no no i can't sustain this level of you know playing especially with a young family and stuff i think pay you if you're young and you don't have kids or you don't have a dependent or anything it's probably easy to do but still like on top of the streetwear line the flipping you know record label which you could probably run for your laptop is not too bad but still it must be a lot to kind of juggle <laughs> So she says the following, I enjoy it also, I enjoy it so much that I forget I'm tired, she says, laughing, right? Same sort of thing you heard from Virgil and he had to take a break. So imagine that this might be the same sort of thing, but she might be a bit more on top of things than Virgil did. But, you know, he had the same sort of thinking, right? I'll sleep when I'm tired. And no, you, you only sleep when you're dead sort of thing. Hustle, hustle, hustle. And it kind of came crashing down at him as well. So you never know, she might take that break as well. Because I think Sven Barn does that, right? Is it Bali too? They have this resort in Bali they all go to? Well, the DJ's venue. Let's continue. Bali's new Irma Design Hotel and Cultural Venue. Uh, dressed in a silky short sleeve shirt and a sporty Mugler shorts, the DJ turned designer looks suspiciously fresh for somebody who's up until the wee hours playing to a rowdy crowd of 3,000. The beachfront gig, uh, whose promotional posters plastered across the island, read Goo New Year, which I love that actually. I love all their merch. It's really cool. Um, coincided with the drop of a new capture collection made in collaboration with an Indonesian, Indonesian hospitality group, right? But 2020 is going to be more low-key for the overachieving music sensation who plans to cut down the live shows to focus on her first album, as I mentioned. It makes sense, right? She needs to... That's the thing that got her to dance. And I really do think maybe, again, I, I say she's an influencer first, but I think she could probably be a even bigger act if she ended up really taking her live act to the next level, like the singing stuff and stage shows. That would be nutty. Is she really kind of lead into that? Because it seems that she's got a lot more confidence and courage in doing the live show than others. I think Nina Kravitz did it at Coachella, but I don't think she's, she seems like she's a bit shy about performing in that sense live. So it'd be cool to see what Peggy Goo does in the future with that kind of live performance. Maybe a piano, going back to her roots, maybe a live orchestra, live orchestra, maybe some sort of 
theatrical thing. I don't know. There's a lot of things to do in that kind of field. And I think, again, she probably could end up being a bigger star as a live act than she is a DJ, which, you know, sounds nutty now, but stranger things have happened. So, crave people, she said here, crave people need uh, to do nothing to be crave, she says, uh, before telling me about the new home studio she's having built in her adopted city of Berlin. The LP follows an eclectic uh, score of dance music EP she sometimes refers to as K-House, released in 2016, as well as recent DJ Kicks Mix. The album, however, will be released by XR Records, which is flipping amazing. Uh, Peggy Goo's dream label, who she remembers emailing obsessively back in Korea to ask about internship opportunities and never once got a reply, which is great, isn't it? Full circle. Imagine you're flipping emailing, uh, you know, XO recordings day in, week out, week in, week out, not getting a reply. And then suddenly now they're asking you to release your album on their label. Amazing, amazing. And again, for, there's, you know, there's a lot, lot to be said about labels being shitty and, you know, doing wrong by artists. But XO Records is still one of the record labels you hear people speaking about in glowing terms. Whenever you see someone wearing a bomber jacket of XO, you're like, wow, is that person signed? Do I know them? Can I get your info and shit? Right, you're, you're just intri- they're just there's so much brand value in that fucking logo. They stand for so much cool and quality music that you're just in really good company releasing on it. So it must be a real dream come true in there, that regard. That's I think some of her merch there she's wearing. Um, alongside this, a 29 year old DJ, which is, uh, I'm surprised she's that old. I didn't know she was that old. I thought she was younger than that actually, concerning her accent. But hey, what do I know? We'll continue to grow her record label, Gudu. So far, the project has acted as a platform to support the work of cult yet overlooked electronic producers from Reflex Records, DMX crew to American remix Mavericks, Maurice Fulton. Some of my legends, she says, who I think deserve more spotlight. Amazing, right? Somebody new in the game, somebody relatively young, fresh, with all the hype around her, using her platform to boost other people up. You cannot hate that, right? Cool. But ultimately, the powerhouse happens to, um, hopes to sign emerging talents, particularly female and Asian musicians, which is great. Um, someone like Peach would be cool for that, that record label, but I'm sure she's already wrapped up. I went through a lot after I signed my first uh, music, she says, remembering the lack of support she received from her first label. This early experience encouraged her to change the game. I want to give artists what they want, which is great, isn't it? An artist is always more attuned to what another artist need it can sometimes be a bit difficult sign to another, another artist record label but she manages it in the right way has people in place who can kind of help manage it it should be good it continues here while peggy is best known for her music career now gathering crowds uh now gathering crowds in thousands at international clubs and festivals alike the first love was fashion after spending her teenage years in london her parents sent her to english they sent her to, they sent her to earn, learn english because they thought i had no future in south korea she applied to London College of Fashion, st- started a course in styling. I realized I wasn't good at it. She says, who barely worked as a, who briefly worked as a correspondent of Harper's Bizarre Career. I really enjoy styling myself, she loves. Uh, this start- so I think this is part of the reason people don't like her, right? The fact that her parents are rich and they sent her off to London to go learn English. But, you know, you can't help the family you're born into, innit? It is what it is. And I think sometimes, you know, there's a lot, I think the kind of affluent thing, dig is not really fair. People are born into families they're born into. They can't do nothing about it. And I sometimes think, the fact that somebody rich or somebody that's got all the means to just live life and get you know have essentially a trust fund and not do much the fact that they go out there and try and make something of themselves i think you should it, it should have you should be able to i don't know some you should put more respect on their name if they're rich and they actually went out there and bust their ass and make something of themselves because you have no reason to right most of the motivation that we have in life i, I can only speak for myself being a man is to you know attract women and to somehow you know not to live the life of poverty that you have when you were younger right that's sometimes something that will drive you the fact that we were especially myself growing up in such a poor household is driven me to be this determined this entrepreneurial to have all these goals all these aspirations that i want in my life is because i came from such you know humble beginnings so most people that's what it is right that's that's where the term rags riches story comes from but if you're somebody as you know has all the resources all the connections all the money you don't have that stress of waking up not knowing where your next paycheck's going to come from. Um, to have the motivation to put yourself out there as an electronic music artist or a DJ. And again, there's only so much her friends can do for her. I think, you know, you might get an in, you might get an intro to kind of have a couple of sets. You know, you might get brought in to play a couple of sets in a couple of cool clubs. But if you're not good, you just won't get invited back again. So I think the fact that she gets invited back again, gets booked, her records get picked up by big record labels and you know she's got a big fan base it goes to show that she's obviously good at what she does isn't it so i don't think the rich thing is fair is a fair insult was a fair critique um 
But again, uh, it carries on here. But this day in fashion wasn't all in vain. Last year, following a series of timely encounters with Louis Vuitton artistic director Virgil Abloh, um, Peggy Goo launched her women's streetwear label Karen. Giraffe in um, Korean, her favorite animal, backed by Off White's uh, parent organization, Italian company New Guards Group, which is which uh, recently acquired uh, by Farfetch, which is great, isn't it? Great for her. I mean, if you're a DJ and someone like a New Guards Group can come in and handle the production and all that sort of stuff, and you just have to kind of maybe approve designs or lend your, you know, your kind of expert eye on things, that's great. Because, you know, the fact of, imagine she was trying to run her own Shopify whilst being a DJ. That's just going to be super impossible to do. You need a whole team to kind of manage that thing for you. But the fact that they've got like a whole studio in Milan that she can kind of go in, drop in, kind of lend her ear to do some design, send some stuff off into a WhatsApp group like Virgil does. I think it's a great uh, situation for her in general, right? Awesome. And of course, it allows New Guards Group an entry into that kind of world. And I wouldn't be surprised if you see New Guards Group doing something similar with a brand like Innovision or something going forward. That would be pretty cool to see. Or even like a Dover Street Market. I can imagine like a Comme des Garçons kind of buying into Innovision and kind of helping them do production. Same way they helped out with... Um, uh, so many other brands. I've got the name of it. Anyway, continue on. Um, these references appear as much in her design aesthetic as a visual identity of a musical universe. Whether it can be the reoccurring motif of the whether that word is across her designs or the traditional mask interpreted by illustrator G. Giok Chow for Gudu's logo, Korean culture remains a strong source of inspiration for Peggy. She says, I always try not to lose a link between Korea and myself. She says, recounting how she cried during her last gig in Seoul after the Euro started to sing along to her Korean language track, Starry Nights. Oh my God, she says, I'm getting goosebumps. She says, getting excited, which apparently in Bali is a good sign. The song... Coincided music video was directed by Peggy's boyfriend, a German born photographer, uh, Jonas Lindstrom, also responsible for co directing um, Kendrick Lamar's Element. It's an eerie tableau to contrasting South Korean landscapes from city to back streets to terrible mountain lakes. But here's a, yeah, so here's a thing that gets me that this is the main part of it. So, when I asked her about a recent gig in Saudi Arabia's controversial MDL Beast Festival, Peggy looks hesitant. Now, if you're not familiar with this, there was a big outrage behind this. She went to go play at some festival in Saudi Arabia. Obviously, I was kicking up a fuss because Saudi Arabia's human rights policies aren't the best. Um, and somebody that kind of takes, you know, she kind of talks a lot about social political things, but then when it comes to her pocket, it seems like she doesn't give a fuck. And I always said from the beginning, I said from my friends, said to everybody that listened to me, that again, I, I think she's proven with her actions that she's just she really is about the paper if you have money you have to book her to play somewhere she'll play anywhere for you which is again not a slight it's not a negative it's just where you position yourself as a dj you have to decide when you're going when you're coming up i think i think in any entertainment industry or any entertainment field there comes a point where you have to decide where you want to go what route you want to take and there is only one it's only it's either or there isn't you can't do both you can't be both a purist and also appeal to the, you know, the of the kind of commercial entities. Because that's why I'm surprised that she hasn't played at Tomorrowland or something like that. Honestly, I'm very surprised because she seems like anywhere that will cut her a check, she would go and play. So I think in terms of her brand, in terms of her sentiment online, again, she probably doesn't care and it probably doesn't affect her at all. But I think if I was part of her team, I would have probably advised against the Saudi Arabia thing just because I think already there is kind of a, kind of a big, not big, but like a small vocal minority of people on social who have a lot to say about Peggy Goo, right? They have a lot to say about her, which is interesting because she's a woman of, she's like a POC, right? As a, what people on social media like to say, she's a person of color, she's a female and she DJs, right? So it's a, it's a really male oriented space, but yet the fact that she's rich and the fact that she obviously doesn't care about, you know, where she goes and plays, it really is at odds with all the people that are woke on social media. Maybe because she's attractive and she's skinny I don't know. It's really interesting to see from the outside just how much hate she gets from other women, right, in the scene. Other people who are also people of color, also people that should be maybe riding with her just because, you know, from, I don't know, race relations, solidarity. It's very interesting to see. Um, anyway, it continues. Um, since drawing it close to the festival in Saudi Arabia, uh, the inauguration of the three day music festival, reportedly organized by Saudi Entertainment Authority, has been under fire in Washington Post. Opinion writer Karen Atia. Model Teddy Qualivan and Instagram account Diet Prada are among those accusing high-profile attendees visibly paid to post flattering content about the experience in Riyadh or partaking in a PR campaign to rehabilitate the kingdom's image in light of recent human rights abuses, including the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, which goes to show, for the most part, people are full of S, right? We know this. Most people that would have been outraged about the whole Jamal Khashoggi killing 
essentially this people it's alleged that somebody from the saudi government cut this guy's body up into different pieces because he had something disparaging to say about the saudi government they probably had a lot to say about that and were up in arms but the moment the saudi government the saudi entertainment um puts you know wires through the money to your account no like you know they don't do split payments they hide they wire the entire amount to your account direct deposit it's available in your account straight away your monzo goes ping you just got a hundred thousand you just got a million to play this flipping festival in the middle of Riyadh. you get flown into a private jet you get a private suite all this stuff suddenly all those politics go woof, out of the window so i'm not i'm not surprised most people are full of s right it takes a real takes it takes a person with real character with a real moral backbone um that has principle to really stand there and say you know what i'm gonna say no and also not to make a big fuss of it because i'm not a fan of people that say no and retweet their no's right S put a screenshot of the email they send rejecting this uh plea to go play in Riyadh. no just stand by your morals stand by your principles your fans should know where you lie or what position you take on certain issues and you just say no you keep your keep it moving you don't make a big deal out of it but i'm sure if peggy would have said no to it she would have probably you know retweet an image or share a flipping instagram story of her kind of writing the email out on the computer but again i think for her for herself i just get the impression i just get the impression she doesn't care she's in it for the money in it for the clout in it for the fame in it for the exposure the access it gets her you know, obviously in the fashion realm she gets to be in fashion without being in fashion which is amazing luxury to have i'm sure most of my fashion friends who are out there in the scene know how hard it is to kind of get any inroads in that industry. The amount of ass kissing you have to do is just nauseating. So the fact that she's able to kind of dip in and out is a great place to be. But again, I'm not surprised at her actions, really. I think people online complaining about it don't aren't necessarily that aware of what she does um, outside of those kind of things. But it continues here. What she say here, she says, uh, <laughs> this is the best thing that a lot of people out. She says, you know what? Peggy Goose says eventually, I'm going to talk about it. Um, having shared a lineup with the likes of David Guetta and Steve Aoki, imagine being a Peggy Goose team and thinking this is a good idea. Again, maybe everyone got paid to get agent managers. Everyone's getting a ten percent, so it might work out better. But come on, man, someone has to think of her long term future. Why is she playing alongside Steve Aoki and David Guetta in the middle of flipping Saudi Arabia? Why is she doing that? She's only twenty nine years old. She's got so much. She's got so much to do in the electronic music scene. Why would you damage your career or damage your appeal or your take or your ruin your rep or your i don't know how you are viewed because imagine what other djs must think talking behind a water cooler but again maybe other djs might want opportunity to play there too i don't know but whew. um she um deplores the storm of online criticism she received which people called her a sellout which i wouldn't say she's a sellout i'll just say she probably doesn't i don't know you can't go you can't go around picking up bottles on a beach talking about global warming and then go and play at Riyadh, right you can't really do that it doesn't make sense in it I, i'm sure Playing in Saudi Arabia cancels out the fact that you picked up bottles on a beach in Saudi Arabia. It doesn't. I don't know. What do you think? A on a beach in Bali? I would say so, right? But what do I know? Um, uh, shell out. Since posting a video from the festival to her 1.3 million followers, influences are different story. She protests, highlighting the fact that she was the only female headliner at the festival, which she believes can help transform local music team, which is a preposterous thing to say. Like she's somehow because you're DJing somewhere and you're the headliner and your name is in bold on the top of a bit of paper that somehow the Saudi government's gonna be like, you know what, women should be driving too. Like what? <laughs> That's not gonna happen. <laughs> what is she talking about? I went there to play music for fans. She says, right? Um, she clarifies. <sighs> This may seem a reasonable position, but it isn't one shared by everybody. Just last summer, Nicki Minaj pulled out of a gig in Saudi Arabia's Jeddah World Festival over concerns about women's rights, LGBTQ rights, and the freedom to expression. A move endorsed by a New York-based Human Rights Foundation, but since previously facing backlash for cancelling a set at DGTL Tel Aviv, she had to apologise for the announcement she posted online. Self-described, naturally selective, she's not naturally selective, she plays everywhere. Peggy Gu explains that she has learned her lesson. Now it's preferring to stay out of politics. I don't, it doesn't matter if it's in Israel or North Korea, she concludes after admitting her Saudi stint involved a substantial paycheck. If there's people who want to hear my music, I will go. I don't give a fuck. Again, now we know where she stands and I'm happy with it. I think as a scene, if you don't like this woman, she has said here quite clearly, I don't give a fuck. If people pay me, if they cut the check, if the money goes into my account, my manager, my agent gets paid, I get a private jet, I get to post that picture with my foot up like that in the private jet, so you can clearly see I'm in a single seater. I don't care. That's what she's proven. So I don't see what the outrage is about. Again, for me, I wouldn't necessarily do this, 
But I think everyone's got everyone's got everyone's career is their own choice, their own journey, you know. People choose what they want to do. And if she wants to come in and do a cash grab and stuff, fair play to her, isn't it? She probably looks at it and thinks, you know what? What damage is it really gonna do, right? If she ends up, you know, not being the most coolest DJ in the, and that's a problem though, I think about her as well, because a lot of her brand value is in how cool she is, right? And I don't think it's cool just selling yourself out like this, right? Standing next to a Porsche when you don't drive, right? Going to Saudi Arabia or wherever it may be cool to go play in the festival and profess how amazing Riyadh is, right? It's not really the cool thing to do. It's going to make you uncool to people that are cool, I would assume. And once she's lost her cool factor, what she do then? Of course, there's an opportunity for her to be a, you know, an amazing live act or end up being a designer and take care to the next level. But I don't know, man. I think if I was an agent, if I was a manager, I would have said there's a long game here, man. You should be a bit careful about where you, where you place her and who she's playing alongside. Like, imagine, she played, like, again, this is me talking about my ass. I'm not sure if this is true, but Peggy Goo played in Saudi Arabia before she played on the lineup featuring Charlotte DeWitt, Emilie Lenz, Nina Kravitz, Helena Half, um, Dr. Rubenstein. Imagine seeing a lineup of all those killer women, female DJs playing in one place, right? It is some big promotion about it. The, the You know, the women going to take things to the next level. I don't know, whatever you promote it as, right? She did a festival in Saudi Arabia before she did that. And I'm sure, I'm pretty sure there must be a stipulation or her agents or managers don't let her play alongside some of the other girls. Maybe, you know, you know how girls are. They can be a bit catty. So there might be some in, there might be some scene beef that I'm not aware of. But how can you play in Saudi Arabia before you go play alongside these amazing girls that are out here on the scene now? It doesn't make any sense, does it? It's crazy, man. But anyway, um, that's the interview on Thingy Majiggy. Um... There's loads of, there's more on here about her being a control fee, but definitely check it out. It's very illuminating. It's on ID Magazine. I'm going to link it in the show notes. It's titled, Peggy Goo discusses online criticism and the resolution for 2020. Again, if you're a fan of hers, if you're somebody that's intrigued by her career and how much hate she gets or love she gets online, definitely recommend and check it out. And again, if you're not a fan of her, she's told you already what her position is. She doesn't care. She's in it for the cash and she's going to keep it moving, isn't it? So you guys need to keep it moving too.